And welcome back to our live coverage of the Detroit Regional Chamber's Mackinac Policy Conference, an annual event where business leaders, politicians, CEOs, nonprofit groups, they all get together up here on Mackinac Island and talk about the future of Michigan, talk about some of the problems that we have and perhaps some of the solutions. And this morning we're concentrating on early childhood education. And joining me right now here at the My Vote desk is Carol Goss. She's president of the Skillman Foundation and Sterling Spurn, CEO of the Kellogg Foundation. Thank you so much for joining me. We appreciate it. You're welcome. How have you found the conference so far, Carol? Very exciting. Um, really good speakers, really good topics, um, really uh, emphasis on uh, innovation and entrepreneurship, and the governor uh, was very good yesterday. So yeah, very good. And Sterling, interesting conversations you've had so far? Yeah, uh, but again, looking at, there was a panel on, with entrepreneurs yesterday, the governor set it up, encouraging people to take risk and be innovative, not have a nice don't have nice conversations. Don't be nice, he don't said. Yeah. This is not <laughs> a nice conference. Yeah, so we, <laughs> yeah, so we tried to do this morning. It's like, you know, let's let's shake it up. And then Fareed Zakaria, it was, it was what is innovation? And we need to do more investing. He said more investing and less consuming. Okay, so let's talk about more investing and let's talk about more investing in our children. We talk an awful lot about K through 12 education. And but now that there is starting to be the conversation coming to the surface that we need to get to children much younger. We need to start that education mm -hmm. process. Sterling, let me start with you. Why is it so important that all of a sudden we start to get the kids into preschool starting at three years old? Yeah, well, at birth, actually. I mean, babies are born to learn. And, at, at, you know, in the first thousand days, everything about how they learn, what, how they're stimulated verbally, how they approach relationships, and their curiosity about the world is all formed in the first three years. So it's even before they would walk into a child care center, the, their home environment, all the people around them, they might be in infant and toddler care, but the starting line is now birth, it's not kindergarten. And that was one of the big things that came out this morning, which is no kindergarten is at five years, you, you've just gone through five years of the biggest opportunity of your life. And if you haven't had great early childhood development and education and support, you're starting behind. And do we see, Carol, that there is a difference when, when kids maybe have started behind where they end up down the line? It's maybe harder than to, to reach them or to, to turn things around? Well, there's a lot of research that says that those children who had early childhood experiences and were in a quality setting are reading at uh, the third grade on the third grade level, that they generally are l uh, more likely not to drop out of high school and not to become involved in the juvenile justice or the criminal system. So we, we know, and we've known this actually for a while, that uh, children that are in quality programs early on and are ready for kindergarten, eager to learn, and on a really wonderful trajectory, that those children do better. And you've seen this work through, through foundations, but now getting the business community involved, um, people may not make that correlation. Why is it so important to now get the business community to invest in some early childhood Chris, education? Chris Reisick said it yesterday, access to talent is the number one challenge in Michigan, and talent <laughs> development starts in early childhood. I mean, the whole, if a child hit third grade, on grade level, you know, ready to take all those skills in math and, and reading to master co content, they, they'd be the talent we want when they come out of high school and college. But if they start behind, uh, David Brooks of the New York Times said, it's sad we can predict high school graduation rates from assessing f five year olds. Right. So the, the business community gets it that investing early at the right, the, the highest leverage, right. mm -hmm. business loves the concept of leverage, the highest leverage for every dollar is in the first five years of a kid's life. And can I add one, one other thing? Um, because I think that did come out um, as well this, um, in the session on early childhood this morning. And that is that, um, those employees who have their children in quality programs are more satisfied, they're more committed, they tend to work harder, and so that, that's a win-win for business, that they have employees who really um, don't have to worry about their children. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think it, that the business, this is really uh, a win-win for business if they get engaged. Yeah, and it is. I have three children myself, and one is three years old, uh -huh. and I have her in a preschool right. program, but it is that you, you know, you're concerned, you want to make sure your kids are, are getting the best education and, and that they are going to be okay. And as parents, um, you know, that's what, that's what your number one priority is. I want to talk a little bit about how 
the foundations have really um, been helping out, not only in education, but now in the cities as well, and in, in specifically Detroit. I think it's very interesting the role that foundations are taking in helping revitalize education, city services. This is a, this is a new arena, I, I feel, that we're, we're coming into, Carol. Well, I, I think, you know, the, the philanthropic sector has a role to play in making sure that the place um, where we're investing, where we live, um, and where we work is, is one of high quality for all of its citizens. And so uh, we see our role at the Skillman Foundation as a partner with the public sector, with the corporate and the private sector, all working together to come up with a place where everyone is supported um, and, and well served and happy. And so our work in six neighborhoods, we work very closely with the residents there really trying to define um, you know, what it is that's going to make that place a better place for children. And so while there are times when we lead on in an area, maybe in education um, and in, in other areas, but then there are other times where we're supporting the agenda of the public sector as well. And Sterling, sometimes people don't realize the investment that place that like Kellogg it makes in in communities but it really means so much in the revitalization of the state yeah well we have a big commitment to Michigan but Detroit as our biggest city we have a big commitment to Detroit and Carol is being modest Carol and Skillman Foundation have sort of led the way into this integrated work that starts at neighborhoods but looks at the school district looks at the city and now we have the Ford Foundation the Knight Foundation the Community Foundation Southeast Michigan uh, Hudson Weber Campbell but uh, uh, they're all there working in an integrated fashion to say, okay, what are we doing yeah. in economic development? What are we doing in education? What are we doing in health? And we actually have a strategy mapping tool now where we can look at our yes. combined work and ask ourselves, what, what, where could Kellogg, maybe Kellogg needs to come in with Skillman over here, or maybe we should go over here. So we're, we're working in a much more integrated way. Amazing collaboration, not a competition, but you're making, uh, right. making areas much better. So thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. And on the topic of, of early childhood education, we're going to take you now to a session on the Michigan Early Childhood Business Plan. My Vote Mackinac is brought to you by Health Alliance Plan, the Masco Corporation Foundation, DTE Energy Foundation, the University of Michigan Dearborn, and by the Center for Michigan. I am Sterling Sparin, the president and CEO of the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, and I'm really excited to be here with this panel on the day when the Michigan Business Plan for Early Childhood will be unveiled later this morning with the Michigan Children's Leadership Council. Um, this has a lot to do with our work at the Kellogg Foundation. I was thinking of our founder, Will Keith Kellogg, yesterday sitting through the panel with those entrepreneurs from Michigan and hearing the governor talk, and then with Fareed Zakaria. Um, Will Keith Kellogg was an entrepreneur, but he didn't start out that way. He was 46 years old when he invented the cornflake and went on to revolutionize point-of-sale advertising and built this cereal company. Um, that was in 1906. Just 24 years later, he committed almost all his personal wealth to creating the Kellogg Foundation in 1930. So for more than 80 years, we've been following his mandate, which was pretty simple. And I like to tell people, may you be blessed with a founder whose heart is pure, whose intent is clear, and whose hands are off. <laughs> he said, do whatever you please, staff and trustees, so long as it promotes the health, happiness, and well-being of children. Well, given that mandate, in recent years, we have recommitted ourselves to the state of Michigan. Currently, we are investing, and I use that word, word investing, as uh, Fareed Zakaria did yesterday, over $80 million a year into the state of Michigan. Um, and that's probably about $300 million of active grants in any given year. And with our colleagues from the other Michigan foundations, our friends from Skillman are here and Kresge, community foundations, a lot of us are coming to focus on this birth to age eight, this early childhood space. Uh, Mr. Kellogg said to us he really cared about kids. He believed that education was the key to improving one generation over another. And he said kids needed help at a time it mattered most. And for us, and I think my panelists, we think that early childhood is the key and a game changer for the state of Michigan. When Dave Zilko sh showed us that great, you know, garden fresh salsa, that Detroit could be the headquarters of the most successful salsa company in the country, I thought, 
Why couldn't Michigan be the place where early childhood is off the charts and how our kids are walking into kindergarten ready to learn? So we're gonna talk about that today and talk about the business case for these investments. So before I introduce my panelists, we'd like to roll a very short uh, two minute video on the Kellogg Foundation's approach to vulnerable kids and then I'll introduce the panel. It all starts with one big question. As a society, how are we doing? Consider this answer. A society is only as strong as its most vulnerable members. And who are the most vulnerable members of our society? children, 31 million of them who are growing up in poverty in the United States alone, and hundreds of millions of children around the world. They live in cities, they live on farms, they live in the suburbs. And they're vulnerable because they're surrounded by the kinds of conditions that create obstacles, like racism, poverty, and fractured families. The statistics are stark for these children in health, education, and nutrition, among other measures. It would be easy to see vulnerable children as an unsolved problem. But what if we saw vulnerable children as potential, growth, possibility, resilience, the key to a strong society? One where thriving children are the very foundation of strong families. Because we know that strong families form strong, stable communities. And it takes strong communities to make the larger changes we need in education, our food and health systems, and our economy. The potential for positive change is everywhere. We see it in the U.S. and around the world. And we're working hard to tap that potential, especially in the places where the W.K. Kellogg Foundation prioritizes its work. In Michigan, Mississippi, New Mexico, and New Orleans. In Mexico, in the highlands of Chiapas and the inner lands of the Yucatan Peninsula, and in Haiti. Because we believe that strong communities can change the world. At the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, we know the future is born every day. Great, let's jump in. I want to thank, thank you, John. I want to thank Governor Snyder for the perfect setup for this panel. The governor encouraged us to break down silos uh, within government and across the sectors of business and nonprofit uh, sectors. He also said we had to look for innovations where we could sustain and scale things. And he said to us, do not make this conference a nice event. Now, if you came to this breakfast to talk about babies and early childhood and have a nice conversation, we don't want to do that. Um, we are at a point where we need a very revolutionary approach to investing in early childhood. And my panelists have an amazing depth of experience across government, business, and philanthropy. So let me, let me introduce my, my co-panelists and set up the first question. To my immediate left is Susan Broman. Susan was just appointed as the first director of the governor's office of Great Start. Um, so her job in Lansing is to bring the insights and commitment to early childhood into the Department of Education. So she also serves as deputy superintendent in the Department of Education. She comes from the Steelcase Foundation where she was president for many years and you know Steelcase is known for its innovation in the business sector. Next to Susan, Paul Hilligans, probably needs no introduction to this group. Paul served in the House from uh, 1979 to 1996, at part of that time as speaker. Uh, after that, he served as president of Detroit Renaissance, and now, of course, is senior vice president for corporate affairs at DTE Energy. Um, so he brings a wealth of experience in many sectors as well on the western and eastern part of the state. And then next to Paul is Chandra Moore. Uh, Chandra's an architect, uh, founder and director of her own firm, Cog, uh, Cog Design. She's, her, her firm specializes in de designing spaces for children, whether it's St. Jude's Hospital or the pavilions on the riverfront. And she has a one and a half year old daughter. So she is very immersed in early childhood. So um, let, 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 me, let, let me set this up first of all. Uh, Susan, you, you, uh, you've walked into this uh, uh, well, let, let me start with Chandra. Chandra, you're far away. Everybody has a story 
about yes. why they are committed and passionate about early childhood. You're an architect. What, yes. what got you interested and passionate about early childhood? Out of 12 years, I've been in architecture. Um, I graduated in 99 from U of D. And when I graduated, I was able to work at great firms, Smith Group, Gensler. And I've noticed that out of the, my career, no one celebrates children on a regular basis. So I've always been very passionate about children. And I wanted to be able to give them the same start and the same goals that I received from my two parents who are very successful in California. So I wanted to be able to give them that same start line and give them a goal that says, regardless of your background, regardless of where you came from, you deserve to start on the same start line as me, as any of anyone else who has children in here. They all deserve to start at the same start line. And that's how I got more involved. And I decided to be an entrepreneur, especially after I had my daughter. And I, I wanted the best for her. So that's, how I, that's why I'm so involved with early childhood. I think it's very important to be a part and make a difference in these children. Oh, and, and we'll come back and ask you how you're bringing architecture to early yes. childhood in Detroit. Paul, um, you're one of our distinguished speakers of the house, now work at one of the, the state's biggest companies. What, what is the interest in early childhood from business, and why should lawmakers care about early childhood at this point in Michigan's history? Well, I have to go back to my own journey. When I was House Republican leader, we had a task force on child care, which went around the state to look at best practices by employers in the area of child care and, and found that uh, businesses quiet, quietly were setting up uh, tax-free spending accounts for child care, doing on-site um, uh, child care in some cases, and supporting local uh, child care coordinating councils at the time. And so we put this all in a, an employer's uh, guide uh, to child care um, and pointed out that what we had heard from employers was that those employees who had children in, in quality care um, were more highly engaged, experienced less absenteeism, um, had a more productive workforce uh, because of that commitment. Uh, then I experienced it myself personally. Shortly after that report was released, we had our first child, Sarah, and then shortly after that, Michael. And my wife and I were both working. And we were blessed um, with the ability to afford uh, placing our children in a quality center in Lansing, uh, which today still, um, we believe, has made a huge difference in their lives as they now are in college and law school. Um, there's no question in my mind that the nurturing and learning that they experienced um, in those first four years made all the difference as they entered uh, the K-12 system. And then Detroit Renaissance. Hmm. And I have seen over the years, and, and now with DTE Energy, the real cost of not having the support of families or the child care for students entering the Detroit public schools. When you look at the dropout rates, when you look at the functional illiteracy, um, I believe that a contributing factor to the challenges of the Detroit schools is that children are not prepared to enter kindergarten. And if they're not prepared to enter kindergarten, they're not going to be um, at grade level reading by the third grade. And then it's hard to catch up. And, and I really do believe an answer to the problems we have in our core central cities, especially with concentration of poverty um, and, and broken families in too many cases, is an investment up front in early childhood. Great. Well, that's a challenge. Uh, Susan, you spent 15 years at Steelcase. Uh, company known for innovation, now you've become the director of the Office of Great Start. What, what's the source of your passion for early childhood? Why did you take the uh, offer from Governor Snyder? 
Okay, um, I'm not an early childhood educator by any stretch of the imagination, and I have not been passionate about early childhood until around 15 years ago when I started at the Steelcase Foundation. The largest grant the Steelcase Foundation had given at that point in time was to Healthy Start, and my boss said to me, um, you need to make sure that this continues. As she introduced me um, a couple months ago, she said, you know, I wanted you to really look at early childhood, but I didn't think you needed to dive this deep. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I got hooked. And the three reasons I got hooked on early childhood are what I call the three R's. The first was, given where I was in a corporation, as well as managing a portfolio of investments, the return on investment. I mean, there are numerous studies from Larry's high scope study, to the Wilder study, to the Nobel laureate study, to the Federal Reserve Board saying that investing in early childhood is a very good return on investment. So from a variety of perspectives, I went to that. The second is what I call the research, and simply brain research. The first thousand days are most critical in a child's development. And as I put it, and given my age, the brain is like this, and the highest development is the first thousand days, and then it's all downhill. <laughs> and then some days it gets really downhill. But then the other part of the brain research is in the connection to me is that public resources are just the opposite. Public resources start like this and then go up. And so to me, given where I come from, the Steelcase Foundation, I'm saying this is a huge design problem. We would not design a system this way given what we know about brain research. So I think that's part of what we're all about is redesigning knowing the research. The final piece, given where I was, and so I'm a human service person in a corporate environment running the foundation, I had the luxury of learning a lot about corporations and how corporations think. One of the interesting pieces that I picked up and have applied to um, the work that I'm doing now and what I was doing in the foundation is this notion of quality control and rework. In a manufacturing environment, there are all sorts of quality procedures to basically reduce any flaws in products. So, because it's incredibly costly to rework the product. If I wish we thought that way about the development of children and thought about how is it that we can set up our systems and our work so that we reduce what I call the rework. If you think about the remediation costs that we have and that we are paying for, it makes you again think, well, this is a huge design problem. How do we figure out how to have quality right from the start and reduce any situation where a child will not be developmentally on track? So those, all of those things coming together, it's like we have this incredible opportunity to redo this so that children actually reach their potential. Thank you. So we have, and I know you have on your desk the business case. You've got several documents. I was struck when Fareed Zakaria yesterday said, innovation is different from research and development. And he compared Microsoft's huge R&D budget to Apple's relatively light budget. Because Apple was more about innovating the ways we think about our businesses and our customers' experience. So I, I don't know that the panelists need to repeat what's on your tables, which is the brain science, the economics, the return on investment. Although I would come to you, Paul. There you are at DTE now. Is there a strong enough evidence base, the business case, for doing this? Because if the evidence is there, why aren't we increasing our investments in early childhood? Uh, well, I, I, I do think, uh, as a former legislator, we, we tend to think shorter term, um, and, and this is a longer term investment. But the evidence is so compelling, and, and Susan has cited uh, uh, some of that, but the, the, uh, for, the, for the dollar spent on early childhood, um, studies show that we can save between two and $11 on corrections costs, for example. Uh, $3,700 per student um, in, in K-12, um, $100,000 over a lifetime. In, 
reduced human services, corrections, uh, special education, remediation costs. So that upfront investment um, isn't seen, perhaps, in a two-year election cycle. But over the course of time, in terms of public spending, um, results in reduced um, remediation or reactive costs, and instead results in a more highly um, talented workforce, for example, for business, um, and, and a more highly productive society. And, and so long term, this just makes all sorts of sense. Um, and Susan has it exactly right. We've, we've gone backwards um, in our expenditures of public money when it, when it comes to uh, what's important for the long term. So what are, what are some of the innovations in this early childhood space? Chandra, you're, you're designing spaces for, for infants and toddlers. I like to say we should spend more on IT that's standing for infants and toddlers, and not information <laughs> technology. That's right. um, more, we, business doesn't hesitate. We need IT, whatever the platform takes. Right. What, what do we need to create spaces and venues for great quality child care and child development? I think if everyone if that has a business, if they start to think outside of the box, so that's one thing that COG Studio tries to do very much. We are working with DEPSA, Detroit Education Public School Academy, at this current moment, creating an earlyhood child development model. And what we have let them to, um, what we've been able to kind of help them think about is how to really think like a, like a kid. And I think we always forget that, especially as adults. We learn, we are, as adults put the fear in kids. Kids don't have fear. We put it in them. We're the ones that say, don't jump on the bed, don't do these things, but they're not scared. We're the ones that do that. So from an architectural standpoint, we need to be able to think outside the box where you can take a reader's corner. If you're telling your child to go and read and you're telling them to go sit in the corner, it's really not innovative. But if you were to kind of create a room in your space where you can cut a hole in the wall, where it's very cave-like, and you're saying, can you go to your reader's corner? It sounds a little bit more interesting and where they're a little bit more innovative to do that. Even from a business standpoint, there are snow dates that happen here in Michigan and across the country. And when there's, when you're, when there's, when there's a snow day, you have to go pick up your child. There's no, you can't, when there, there's a snow day, there's fevers. There should be a place in, uh, in business and in office, in offices that you can take a 300 square foot space and your child could go there for the day to understand how it is that you work, understand the idea of working. And just to understand that I'm going to go to work with my mom or my dad today because it is snow day. And that's what starts to happen from an architectural standpoint. If we start to kind of think from an innovative point of how we can be better, even taking the idea of looking at cognitive skills and developing their social skills, cognitive skills and social skills as in such creating environments where there's sensory gardens. There should be sensory gardens in the city of Detroit. So therefore, the kids will be able to understand and use those senses. Right now, they don't have that. So what happens at the, at the child after school? The mom and dad still have to go to work. They're still working all day, and the child goes home. Well, what ends up happening is the child is by itself. And when the children is by itself, that means mischief. <laughs> and when the child is in mischief, that's, it, it just, it's a cycle that continues. And then all of a sudden, we have teenage pregnancy. We have crime happening. But if we were to able to kind of create these youth centers where there's after school, I know when I grew up, I had to go to the library after school, and I just had to wait for my parents. And I feel that we have forgotten that. I feel that we send our, and we do it for some kids, but we don't do it for all kids. And we believe that from architecturally, we give the child what we believe as adults what they should earn based on their parents' mistake or their, their stupidity, or their lack of. We, we as adults give that to them, versus just giving them what they deserve. No child asks to be born into any family, and that's what disturbs me architecturally. We, we, we give a little bit, we fluff up a couple of spaces, and we say, this is our kid's space. My daughter attends the YMCA daycare downtown, 
and it is phenomenal in there. And I see they go on field trips every day, they're down on the ground with them, and I feel that we need to have more of those spaces, and that's why I'm working with DEPSA currently right now. I'm also working with, we're also working with the Homes for Black Children located on Larnard, and that's another space that we're working on for them, and inspiring those young kids that they can and they can be and do whatever they set out to be. And I think that's what we forget. We forget to embed that in them because their parents messed up. Well, they did, that's true. But every kid still <coughs> deserves to be on the same start line as your child, as your child. It, it, they just deserve it. And so from architecturally, we may, wanna make a difference. We wanna be able to say, at the counseling clinic uh, at U of D, we did the, uh, the, the counseling clinic in there, and Dr. Pickover said, um, I said, how is, how is the kids doing in the space? And it was a counseling clinic for battered children. And an eight-year-old went up to her, and, and he opened the door, and he said, all of this is for me? And, she, and that right there is enough for me, to let them know that somebody cares. And that's all, that, that's all that the kids need. They need to know that somebody exists and somebody cares for them, regardless of their parents, if it's one parent or two parents or cursing parents, yelling parents, somebody cares. And somebody cares enough architecturally to create a space just for them. Great. So we definitely, thank you. We, we definitely, uh, if we approach this early childhood issue as a business opportunity, we would not try to just increase our funding by 5% a year and slowly, incrementally. We would go for capturing the market. There are over 100,000 babies born in Michigan every year, about 117,000. That's about a half a million families with kids from zero to five. If we looked at this as a business opportunity and said, there is a marketplace of 500,000, that's not a huge number for a business, how do I attack that so that I can deliver every five-year-old starting at birth, you know, walking into kindergarten ready, ready to rock and roll? Now, Susan, the Office of Great Start is a start. Um, many, many of us, we've supported the state's race to the top application, the, the Department of Education, the federal department has a race to the early learning race to the top application. There's a new premium on states having birth to grade, third grade integrated in a, a, a long continuum. Last night we were walking to dinner and you said you, you are sort of the first infiltrator in the, in the <laughs> K-12 system. Um, but your challenge is not to be looked as an add-on zero to five, but actually true education reform redefines education as starting at birth. So how are you doing with the governor's imprimatur to work with the K-12 system to get zero to five as critical and as, as Paul said, that's really where the game is. I mean, that five-year-old walks into school, they will be on, on grade level by third grade. So how is it going in the Office of Great Start? Well, first of all, I have to acknowledge that I'm working for somebody who gets this. Mike Flanagan has been a leader in figuring out how to integrate early childhood with K through 12 for years. Um, we've worked together for 20 years with the ready to, back to the ready to succeed. So you need to have a, uh, be in a position with a leader who has the understanding of how to actually do this. Couple things, um, the first thing that it sounds really simplistic, but I think I have to say it because people need to think about this really clearly. We have to disabuse ourselves of the notion that learning begins at kindergarten. And that doesn't sound like a big deal, but that's a, a huge cultural change. Um, part of what we're doing as in the Office of Great Start is looking at all of the different environments that young children are in, and you mentioned a number of them. Um, there's Head Start, <clears throat> there's Child Care Facilities, there's Great Start Readiness Facilities, and trying to ensure that there is quality in all of these settings. I think about, in particular, <clears throat> the child care. Um, subsidy program, um, and at this point, that program was started and has been historically a work support program so that parents could go to work or go to school. Our job now is to take this as an opportunity to transform it from, and people hate when I say this, child storage right. to an early learning environment. Right. 
And we're missing the opportunity when we don't think about, regardless of where a child is in his or her early childhood, that we have quality programming and that we have a quality environment that's focused on early learning. And so again, it's, it's working with this and all the Head Start and the um, Child Care and the Great Start Readiness are all within the Office of Great Start. So it's trying to look at this across all of these systems and figure out how do we actually improve the quality. The other piece is trying to integrate this and one of the interesting things is um, actually talking to new superintendents and again, this, a lot of this is cultural and um, saying to them, I hope you know who your new friends are. And they kind of look at me like, well, what is she talking about? And I said, well, you really need to understand Head Start. You really need to be working with the early childhood programs in the community because they're basically preparing the kids to come to kindergarten. And you've got to make sure that you know these people and that you're trying to improve the quality because it will make your life uh, incredibly better. The other piece um, that, when you think about it, is the grades that kids repeat the most are kindergarten and first grade. The notion to me is, I thought, how can you flunk kindergarten? But I mean, but that's I mean, that's just looking at the data. Just think what we could do to reduce that if, in fact, more and more children were in quality early childhood programs. I mean, so when you think about it, it's like, well, how do we realign our work and our thinking? The other part of the job is not necessarily to look for what I call, in quote, new money, but to really challenge people to rethink their existing resources and how to move their resources where, in fact, they're going to make the most good. So public schools have an opportunity to really rethink and, okay, why don't you support more early childhood programs with your existing resources? How do you want to really look at this as a continuum, if we're really talking about a continuum of P through at least 12th grade? Great. Well, the, so the Michigan Early Childhood Business Plan that's on your desk actually segments the zero to five space, Paul. It, it talks about universal pre-K for four-year-olds. It talks about, what, 38,000 four-year-olds that are not in quality child care, as Chanda was describing. But there's also this birth to three, where, as Susan was saying, the first 1,000 days are, are actually, it's, it, the brain is the location, it's the, it's the geography. It probably shouldn't be the metaphor, because a child's whole orientation to their social and emotional relationships, their curiosity about learning, you know, as Chandra said, you're not born fearful, you're born to learn. Mm -hmm. And in fact, human babies are so vulnerable that their only job in life is to build relationships with the people around them. Mm -hmm. In fact, they don't even know they're individuals in their early years. They're just getting reflections off the faces and sounds of all the adults and other people around them. So how do we make this business case, Paul? You know, Angel Gambino yesterday said, we need radically different business models for our work. And, and Chris, uh, Rick DeVos talked about some of the obstacles to entrepreneurship, and one of them was cultural beliefs. I, I think we have a, when we understand how to start businesses in the business world, but when we think of how would we reinvent this zero to five with, 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 when, our, when our cultural beliefs are that's public money, that's not investing, that's social service, and versus the incredible power of the return if done right and done to scale. Well, first of all, um, as, as I uh, cited with my personal experience, we, we all um, see the success. Um, of quality child care in those first three years um, for those of us who can afford it. Right. Uh, the, the foundation community has been very helpful in expanding uh, the, those kinds of child care opportunities or home visitations. In fact, when I represented Allegan County, uh, Kellogg um, set up a pilot in the county, um, parents as teachers, where yeah. you did home visits or, or paid for home visits and it made a marked difference for those families um, with, with children whose parents couldn't afford uh, that, that kind of uh, nurturing and, and learning experience. So we have a basis upon which we can look at what public money could do to expand those programs to disadvantaged families. Um, yes, 
it would take a radical investment. Um, it, it will take time. It'll take many years. And the business plan is to focus on the uh, four-year-olds. But even a four-year-old um, program will cost hundreds of millions of dollars to be fully implemented. And that will take time, not to mention then expanding what foundations uh, have done for, for uh, uh, disadvantaged families in those zero to three years. Um, and so uh, first, um, I think business can lead by example. And there are many businesses, I know PNC, for example, I don't want to name all sorts of names, but PNC has been very involved in uh, early childhood programming. Uh, DTE Energy just made a grant to uh, Women's Caring, a, a multi-year, <coughs> three-figure grant. And we're focusing on quality child care for working poor families who wouldn't qualify for public funding. But that, all that work still leaves the question of public funding. And, and it will take many years. I would say to um, uh, lawmakers today that um, take a look at what the reactive cost is of not making that early childhood investment in human services and K-12 special education and remediation. And as the economy recovers, which it is doing, and those human services costs decline, um, and the revenue increases um, in the K-12 budget, for example, I think it's time to take more of the money, more of that economic dividend, and invest it up front. Because long term, that's going to reduce the uh, cost of human services and, and uh, K-12 costs down the road. Um, so I think first, it's, it's uh, looking at, at the evidence that is there and then um, making uh, decisions to set different priorities as the economy recovers. Well, the governor talked about uh, that in any innovation, there's always risk. And risk isn't to be avoided. It's to be managed. Um, in social investing, I mean, there's no question, and Fareed Zakaria pointed out that we spend $4 for every person over the age of 65 in the United States and only $1 for every person under the age of 18. And that's not a long-term business model that buys you an investment in the future. And as uh, Chris Reisick said yesterday, access to talent in Michigan is the number one challenge. And that talent is ready to be developed in the first five years. But it seems to me the risk is, will we be bold enough to make that investment and like a startup, be all over that investment to make sure it's producing results. Now, we know the evidence-based programs in home visiting for, you know, in the very early years and in quality preschool, but we can't afford to throw public dollars at, at mediocre businesses. You know, and we, we, need to, we need to recreate the whole notion of what, what excellence and success is in early childhood. But I, I wish, Susan, we could get that money from the current system, but I just don't think it's fair. If I went out to a venture capitalist or an angel investor, I'd say, I need some money. I, I need to be able to do this. One creative financing mechanism now is the social impact mm -hmm. bonds, where you could actually float bonds to get the capital to invest in early childhood, and as Paul was pointing out, reap the dividends in all the social, social budgets and in the business sector for the talent in Michigan. But how we, how we turn that corner, I think, is, is, a, is a challenge. Um, we do want to open it up for questions from the audience. Uh, there, is a, there is a microphone, so I, uh, I hope you're on the edge of your seat with challenging questions for Chandra, <laughs> Paul, or Susan. Um, so please be thinking of your questions. Um, Chandra, you, you, have a, you have a small design firm, mm -hmm. 12 people. Mm -hmm. um, but you, your clients, you interact with clients, a, a charter school in Detroit. Yes. Um, are, are you seeing people in some of your work when they think about children and children's spaces? Are, is, is there a new awareness about early childhood in addition to the, the K-12 years? There is now, and it's interesting how everyone is involving into just opening up different ideas and innovation. And that's what I like so much about the DEPSA. They're, they're thinking outside of the box. And that's what <laughs> makes it so, so interesting. The idea of thinking that, thinking like the kid and, and being able to provide the space just for the child, for the user. And I think in architecture, we celebrate the adult and sometimes the user. And with our method, we celebrate the user. So if you are the adult or the kid, but the, the child will come first. And so architecturally, it's really interesting how everyone is definitely seeing a, a better difference. And even if you think about the age gap, at age four, the 
gap in a low income children is 18, is 18 months behind the developmental norm. And it's still present by the age they're, by the time they're 10. That's a huge gap. And so what we're trying to do is close that gap by creating these innovative spaces that allow them to think outside of the box. Paul, final comments before we open up to questions? Well, I, I, there are uh, um, always competing priorities. Um, higher education, um, I know the business leaders from Michigan has, has taken the lead in, in saying that needs reinvestment. Um, and I agree with that. Um, but I, I, I think as we look at the priorities, um, you cannot ignore um, the importance um, based on scientific evidence of that upfront investment in our children. Um, that, that will reap dividends in the K-12 system and uh, ultimately um, have many more students ready to go to higher, to higher education opportunities and, and provide a productive, talented workforce. And if, uh, if we're serious about economic development in the state and the role of government in investing in our future and supporting economic development, you cannot ignore early childhood. Uh, Susan, I, I was uh, in Washington, D.C. last week, and former Governor John Engler uh, was, gave brief remarks at lunch, and he, he sits on the Annie Casey Foundation board, so he's drunk the Kool-Aid of grade level success by third grade. Um, he actually said, why would we fund STEM education if our five-year-olds aren't entering kindergarten and aren't learning how to read? Uh, I was sort of struck because we have a great STEM initiative in the state of Michigan working with six of our great universities and five high need districts and we're supporting 270 new career changing teachers that are going to go back to school, get a teaching credential and teach math and science in middle school and high school for at least three years. But I was struck, you know, because we care about Michigan along the age continuum for kids. But if our kids aren't learning to read and aren't feeling like success and that's a significant proportion of them. I was struck when, you know, the, the world Fareed Zakari <coughs> described yesterday is it's a great world to plug and play if you've got a plug. Um, <laughs> if you know how to read and are curious about learning, you may have lots of careers, but if you don't, you're not in the game. I, are, are we at an inflection point, Susan? Is Michigan going to be one of those states that breaks out because the business community, along with government and the foundation and nonprofit sector, decide we're going to go for this the way business goes for things, not the way the incrementalness of public budget usually tackles? things a couple I hope we are but first I'll say that um, approximately a third of the kindergartens entering kindergarten are not on track and are not ready the statistics and the governor was brilliant to put in reading proficiency at third grade if kids are not reading proficiently by third grade they're going to struggle because after that point, you have to be able to read to learn. And so if you're not reading, you're going to be staying behind. I think we are slowly moving the culture to really think about things from what I call, let's keep kids on track right from the beginning. But it's going to take a fair amount of political will to change where we're allocating our resources. And it also is going to take thinking about things past what I call quarterly profits and term limits. Um, we have to think about the investment in children over a 20-year horizon. Um, in some of my worst moments, I say, well, let's just take the money out of the criminal justice system and, and we'll, they'll get it back if we actually front load the system. But I really think it is not just the public sector, it's a public sector, the business sector, philanthropy, and just parents saying, we need to do better. This is not working. And if you look at the statistics about children, um, we're not moving in this direction, we're moving in that direction. And there are incredibly, what I call, brilliant programs and opportunities in the state, but they're not to the scale where we're significantly impacting most children. And that's going to cripple us and keep our talent pool as a state behind. So I think it, it takes a broad coalition of people actually 
working at a local level and working at a state and federal level saying we need to do better for our children. Well, I hope the, I hope the Michigan Early Childhood Business Plan that's unveiled today will be the launching pad. I know uh, Paul and Chandra, you were early signers of that mm -hmm. plan.